Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to show a bunch of different examples. This isn't like exhaustive by any means. There's going to be there's way too many games to talk about, but I'm just going to talk about a few key uh, sort of changes throughout game history. There's also like the whole world of animation, which is another a lot of the innovations that are driven that we see in the game world are driven by the animation world or the computer graphics world or uh, other you know uh, implementations graphics and of course they all influence each other. So I'll talk about that a little bit, but we're really focused on specifically on games, um, although I do touch on it a little bit of the early history of 3D graphics. Um, so anyway, not exhaustive. There's a lot of games that I'll, I'm going to talk about that you guys will be familiar with, some that you may not be. And then there's some games where it's like this is the first time we saw this, but sometimes it's hard to know when the first time we saw a particular technology. So sometimes it'll be like this might have, you know, this is around the beginning of that era. Um, but as we take a look at these different examples, a couple of things I want you guys to keep in mind. So uh, one is how did 3D graphics change the experience of an interactive experience? I should not use experience twice in that sentence, but it's hard to write about uh, interactive experiences. Um, a video game being obviously an example of an interactive experience. But there are other interactive experiences that are not necessarily video games. Um, but how do 3D graphics change things versus 2D graphics or film or uh, you know other types? And then what are the unique affordances of a 3D environment? So affordance is kind of like a fancy word of basically saying what does it do that other things can't do. So an affordance is like you know uh, your gamepad in a in a game system is an affordance. You click on the button and it interacts with the game world. So there are affordances, there are things that we can do with a 3D environment that we can't do in other environments. And so we want to think about why are 3D environments so much more popular? They're not necessarily much more popular, but why are they, you know, uh, why do they have kind of the status that they have? Um, and what can we do with 3D environments that we can't do in other places? Um, so we're going to look at something very old to start. This is the first uh, 3D computer animated graphic from 1972. Uh, this guy is just the person who posted the video. I should edit that out. Um, but we'll see the names that made this. So these are these two guys who eventually went on to become Pixar. And this is the first 3D rendering that they made uh, based on their own software. And this eventually got used in a movie. Um, and it led to, uh, you know, a, a, lots of innovation um, in 3D animation and 3D graphics, and it's kind of the beginning of of what we you know know today about 3D. Um, and so, one of the things that we'll see is it's very very simple. Like these animations, they, we have these meshes, right? So that we have these like 3D geometries, which at the time very very new. Um, but uh, you know. This looks obviously really, really simple to us. These, um, and so we can see the kind of like basic components of 3D animation in this video. So the thing that makes 3D graphics so much more complex than 2D graphics is that we're not just dealing with color and position and shape. We're dealing with when we add, you know, a third dimension to a design. We're also making it so that we can can see it from any angle. And that sounds very simple, um, but it actually adds this like crazy amount of complexity um, to designing the graphics because you have the shape of the thing, but then you also have to consider how is the how does this thing what color is this thing supposed to be what how do we deform it when we look at it from different angles, and then how does the light interact? So where are the highlighted areas and where are the dark areas? Does it look shiny? Does it look rough? There's all these new things that we have to consider. Um, and so we can see it in this video, we kind of see the process that went in to creating this. They like mapped this hand, they kind of drew out all the geometry. Uh, and then they use cameras, they use computer vision, um, and then they recreate it on the computer. Um, so this is very long, but let's look a little bit. So yeah, here's the, here's the animation. And so you can see they're really just using the model, right? There's no, there's nothing that we recognize from games today in that first bit, right? There's just the wireframe 
or the mesh, we call this a mesh, of where these different parts are. And what we call each one of those areas is a polygon. So the mesh is made up of polygons. Okay, so then we add shading on top of it. So shading is another program that decides what to draw inside the polygon. And so now we're drawing this smooth uh, area around the polygon. And you can see, even in this old video, there's highlights, there's dark areas, there's all this information that's changing as the camera angle changes and as the hand changes shape. So even for something this simple, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of information. Uh, I have like a little face at the end here, but that's pretty much what I wanted to show. Keep going. So this is not a game. This is just like the fir very first uh, 3D animated uh, sort of video. And it was kind of made as like a, a proof of concept. And then it was later used in some films. And stuff like that. Um, so then this again is not a game, but it's the first 3D graphic system that was on a personal computer, the Apple II. And again, what we see is just these wireframes. So it's just mesh data, just drawing white lines between points. We're not thinking about um, you know, color or light, just thinking about position and shape at this point. And the thing I like about this is it really shows the work that goes into rendering something in 3D because they use this plane here. You can see this plane, and this is very unsophisticated 3D rendering. They're basically just saying the farther away we are from this camera, the, the smaller we get, right? That's just basic perspective. So the back of the plane is smaller than the front of the plane. I'm not talking about the spaceship, I'm talking or the space shuttle, I'm talking about the floor. And we can see each one of these polygons kind of like stretching away from the camera. So that's recreating perspective. Perspective is how we see things, right? It's not how the world actually is, it's how we view things. So the way that 3D changes has to do with point of view of the camera. Um, and that's kind of an interesting thing that we'll see again and again, is that we're not really in games, not really re recreating the real world or uh, even really how we see the real world, a lot of the time we're recreating how cameras see the world because that's what we're used to when it comes to movies, uh, cinema, things like that. Okay, so we still haven't made it to games. Here's our first game. Uh, there are some earlier 3D games, but this is like, you know, one that people played and you guys have probably seen, if not this graphics, you may have seen something that looks like this. Before. And we're still in the world of wireframes here. One thing that's a little bit more interesting is we have a 2D interface superimposed over a 3D uh graphic scene so it looks a little bit more like a modern video game um, but we still just have wireframes so we're just drawing lines between the polygon um, and this is an early rendering system called a vector rendering system this is obviously not the rendering system that we use today uh, this was popular because it ran really fast on these early machines um, so you could actually have animation and interaction uh, but it's not sophisticated enough to draw textures and lighting and all the stuff that we're using. Um, but there's like cool animations and stuff. It is pretty cool uh, what it is. Okay, so that's 1980, that's Battle Zone. So then a lot of the games in the 80s and even into the early 90s uh, use this thing that we sometimes refer to as pseudo 3D or two and a half D where there's 2D planes, but they're arranged in a 3D environment to recreate the idea of 3D perspective. Um, so this is an early version of this. This is 1981. Uh, Monster Maze. Skip up a little bit. We have some hints. OK. So what you see here are, these are image sprites. Like they're just really simple pixelated images but they're distorted to, to make it look like you're in a maze to match camera's perspective. So things that are far away are smaller, things that are closer are larger. And it's very limited. So one of these early computers and consoles had very limited memory and they had very limited processing power. So to run something fast enough to look reasonable for an interaction, for a game environment, you had to really limit a lot of things. Like the color palette is limited, the directionality is limited. Like I can only face in four directions. I can't smoothly turn around. 
you can see the turns just go from one angle to 45 degrees uh, or 90 degrees around. Um, and there's still like text telling you what's going on. Uh, let's skip ahead a little bit. It's kind of cool looking, honestly, but you know. Oh, did we miss the part? Okay, I think this is where we get used by the month. There he is. So it's kind of it's kind of just like a jump scare. And so then you try again. So this is not like a true three rendering system. This is using two D sprites and uh, distorting them in a way to imitate three D perspective. And that's actually what the first like really popular three D game was. Um, so this is Wolfenstein three D. This is kind of like the first thing. Uh, there is a lot of Nazi stuff in here, so sorry about that, but. Um, that's the theme of the game is you're fighting all these Nazis. Um, also, there's a lot of violence in a lot of these videos. So uh, that's not necessarily what I would like to show, but that's just kind of video game history. Um, that's something I tend to talk more about in uh, the intro to video games class. But um, now uh, it's just, you know, I'll just mention that that's an aspect of a lot of what we're going to see in these examples. Anyway, this is a little bit more sophisticated 2.5D. So this is 10 years later than Monster Maze. Um, and so the, the amount of colors that we can show and the speed, those things have improved. But we still haven't really done real 3D rendering. Yet. Um, and so these are 2D sprites that are distorted to give us a sense of 3D perspective. But you can tell looking at it that it's not true 3D, not meshes with uh, It is. Wolfenstein came first. Yeah. Doom is 1993. Wolfenstein is 1992. But I think they're made by the same people. Um, and those games are like, so I was, what, I was like seven in 1992. So I was like the exact right age when these games came out that they had a massive impact on me. Um, and so, you know, we all have like a specific relationship with the games that we grew up with, right? So it's highly dependent, like, you could be a few years older, younger than somebody and have like a totally different experience. Like for example, I missed Pokemon by like five years. So if you're five years younger than me, you probably know a lot about Pokemon. I don't know almost nothing about Pokemon uh, just because of you know the era I was born in. But Wolfenstein and Doom came out when I was like seven or eight. And you know, for me, I wasn't allowed to play these games. So I had a computer when I was a kid and I played like King's Quest, I played like Commander's Keen, stuff like that. But I wasn't allowed to play games with guns. In. But obviously I had friends that did have those games. So I would go to my friend's house and we would play these games that look like crap now, but we would play these games for hours. Um, so this, th these were like really hugely influential games for me. As a kid. Uh, like this one as well. A lot of these games that I'm showing are, you know, I have a personal relationship with. Um, so Mist is is kind of famous for being this sort of like uh, you know unique kind of game experience um, because it you know it's like this it has this puzzle it has really beautiful graphics for the time um, and they used the thing that's interesting about Mist is we're starting to see people using 3D in different ways. So again, this isn't real time 3D rendering. They use 3D graphics, but they made movies out of it. They rendered out movies. And then when you're playing the game, you're really just clicking on different movies. So you might be going to the right or to the left, but you're not actually moving in space. You're clicking on a different movie and it's playing that movie. So that's how they could get 3D graphics before the computer, the computer had the power to actually render 3D real time. They would make these 3D movies and then you would just click on different movies. There are a lot of games like this in this era. Let me move ahead to it. So yeah, you can see it a little bit better here. So there's movies and images. So you can see I'm just clicking, going to the next image. They use 3D graphics. Computer's not fast enough to render it in real time. So the solution there is to make images of every single scene that you can walk through. Um, so they're dealing with these different ways of, uh, you know, the limitations of the hardware. But there's some really pretty scenes in Miss. Miss is a really fun game. I think they did a revamp of it at some point, um, but I I highly recommend it if you played it before. Uh, it was really a big deal when it came out because uh, there just really wasn't 
any games like this. Now there's a, there are some games like this, um, some more kind of like pretty puzzle type game. Uh, but Mist is kind of a big one. Um, so then 1996, we have the N64, we have polygon rendering. So uh, this is pretty cool. Um, you can see a couple things here. One is that we have texture. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, but everything is flat shaded, right? Like there's no dynamic lighting. There's no shadow. Uh, there's like, there, it, we still haven't gotten to the point where we have a lot of the things that we expect from graphics. Um, but we do have like real legit 3D polygon. Uh, so we're starting to see that for the first time. And that was, you know, a huge selling point of the Nintendo 64. Um, another game around the same time, 1997. This is, again, this is not real-time 3D, uh, but it's getting a little bit closer. So these are more renderings of 3D environments, um, but <clears throat> there's a little bit more sophistication to the animation. Uh, so these are just cut scenes, but let's skip ahead to like a real. So you can tell it's a 3D environment, but it's rendered out. Like the light is not being, you know, rendered in real time. They've rendered out these 3D environments, but they set it up so that these sprites can walk around. And so it's a little bit more sophisticated. You can get a little bit more detail. Um, and this is a really pretty game. They put a lot of work into graphics and stuff like that. Uh, but it's not real. It's not real 3D. It's still just kind of making it. Okay, so then Quake is like the first like really real 3D game. And this was a huge, huge game when it came out. Um, and the Quake engine really changed a lot of things. There are a lot of games that were based on the Quake engine. So the things that you can notice right away, first of all, I can look up and down in this game. So that's one way that you know that it's real 3D because I don't have to completely control in those scene, in those games that are faking 3D, they can't let you look up and down because they don't have the, you know, they don't have the ability to render that much information beforehand. But the, this engine is rendering in real time. So they can render all these different angles so you can have smooth movement, you can look up and down, you can look at the scene from all these different directions. The other thing you can see here is dynamic lighting. So lighting is constantly changing. And so that means that you can have dynamics. You can have dark parts of a level and then go into light parts of the level. You can have like a flashlight, you know, all these things that you can add to the game design that you couldn't have before. There's also more detailed textures in here. Um, they're still pretty flat looking because uh, we haven't gotten to shaders yet. Uh, but you can see there's a bit more detail just in the image images that are being used for the texture. And then the all the characters, like the NPCs, the enemies, they're real 3D. So they're 3D polygons with textures and animated. They're not, you know, faked um, like we saw in the other. Um, so the Quake engine was like a huge deal when it came out. Uh, and it set, you know, New standards for what a lot of games look like. Again, very, very violent. Um, but uh, you know, that's just part of the part of the history. Um, so uh, we can keep going. So then jumping ahead a little bit. So this game Crisis is interesting because I've never played this game and I don't feel like people talk about it, but it comes up a lot when you're reading about stuff because it was the first game to use shaders. I think it actually is a pretty good example of what came sort of like what more of an expectation for the graphics um, that we're used to now. Uh, let's head a little bit. And shaders basically are like little computer graphics programs. Um, and so you can see this, there's just this obvious like crazy level of detail in this uh, game engine. Um, you know, we see like the light is interacting with different textures in the scene differently. There's different types of reflections, there's dynamic shadows, there's lighting. All of this stuff that wasn't possible before because the big techno technological change that happened around this time 
is the separation of uh, processing and graphics. So computers before this used to just have a processor that was doing everything to render the game. And now, uh, you know, PCs and consoles basically have a separate graphics trip. Yeah. So your graphics card is rendering all the graphics while your processor is doing the interactions and uh, you know all this other stuff that makes the game run. The shaders are just little programs that basically tell each polygon how to distribute color according to lots of different factors like angle, light, you know, different uh, shininess or roughness, all these different properties. Um, so Crisis was the first game. And the Crytek engine was like kind of the first engine that took advantage of this new technology, but it quickly became standard. Uh, the next big change is around here. I, Assassin's Creed is not the first game to use this, but I think it's the most famous one. And this is just like literally a graphics example. And this is using something called physically based rendering. This is just a more sophisticated shader program where instead of kind of like imitating how light looks and things like that, they're actually basing their calculations on like the physical properties of different materials and light and stuff like that. And that's what Godot does as well. That's why when we looked at the material in Godot, there's so many different options because physical things have lots of, lots of different properties. And so to render them, there's lots of different things that we have to consider. And so it, this kind of era of the early 2010s, there's a lot of games uh, that start to use physically based rendering or sort of imitations of this. Um, and one of the things that's kind of interesting as well, we see this kind of toggling back and forth between hyper-realism, like we see in this game, and more stylized style games. So as the, as the graphics get more advanced, when the, so starting with the early graphics that we looked at, it's very stylized, because we didn't have enough data and processing power of the computer to make things look real. So things look stylized by, by default. But then as we get more and more sophisticated, we can make these photorealistic rendering. So this realism becomes really immersive. We have like, you know, World War I sims and like all these things that look as real as possible, where there's like a lot of dark tones and, uh, you know, they're not using neon graphics and stuff like that. So as the technology got more sophisticated, there's kind of a lot of people leaning into more realism. But then as things get more realistic, of course, people are going to lean back into stylization to kind of add more visual interest to games. Um, so anyway, this era, like early 2010, we start to see uh, physically based rendering. And there's this sort of combination happening between real time rendering and some stuff that's called what they call is baked. So, for example, rendering things like shadows in real time is very expensive. For your computer it takes a lot of energy so if there's certain things that don't change that much you can bake the shadows meaning the shadows are actually part of the texture meaning they don't change but you may never notice whereas something's constantly moving then you have to render the shadow in real time because it'll be too obvious if it's baked. so this is you know they're sort of like still using combinations of okay so overwatch this is a few years later they are using a lot of the same rendering techniques. You'll see that with the lighting. There's a lot of cool lighting in Overwatch, but they're kind of leaning back into stylized graphics. Okay, so one reason they're doing that, Overwatch is obviously a co-op game. And so when you add network and you have 100 people playing at the same time, suddenly you're stressing the computer again. So one way to get back some of your processing power is to make the graphics less. So if you have a lot of people playing together, you have to prioritize sending data across that network. And for the computer is doing a lot of work to do that. So we can save a little bit of work uh, by stylizing the graphics. more. So you can see in these examples, there's still dynamic lighting in a lot of cases. There's still shadows. There's still things like bloom. There's a lot of bloom. Game bloom is like when the lights look like they're, you know, uh, expanding from the light source. Um, so there's still a lot of cool stuff going on graphically, but it's much, much more stylized. And if you look at the textures, they're not really going for realism. They're kind of cartoony in a lot of ways. Um, so they can save a little processing power by leaning back into this stylized version of things. And most games now are kind of doing both a little. They have some realistic aspects and they have some more. Um, 
Um, all right, I think I just have one more example. Yes, I forgot. So this is a more recent one. We talked about this one. I, this is, I, I do think this is actually a really good example because you can see the physical based rendering. Like when you're looking at the ground, you can see all these different reflections, all these different, a lot of crazy detail. At the same time, this is a very like futuristic game and there's a lot of very stylized stuff. There's a lot of stylized colors. Uh, you know, there's a lot of neon, a lot of different graphics, and it does look a little bit like Blade Runner in the sense that it's obviously style. Uh, so there's, you can see this kind of combination of all of these different things. But these days we have so much processing power, we can do uh, physically based rendering, we can do all these new techniques with lighting and stuff like that, um, that we can make these really, really complex scenes. I mean, just look at all the, there's all these reflections, glass, uh, and there's different types of reflection, really a lot of crazy stuff uh, going on in here. Uh, so this is kind of like, you know, the more recent stuff. There's obviously uh, even more uh, things that have come out since this one that are even more impressive. Uh, I think this end. Yeah. Ray tracing. So ray tracing is like, um, can look it up. It's basically like a complex way of calculating light. Uh, so uh, you can see it's like it's a more like modern standard. Um, trying to find there's a good example. Yeah, it's doing like multiple calculations of where the light is hitting. So instead of just saying like, here's a light and here's where it's hitting and that's the number of how bright it is, it's doing like, it's calculating like based on all the different angles and all this stuff. Um, there's a good example of it. Uh, somewhere, I thought it was. There's some, I remember there was something I was looking at that was like a side by side. I don't think it was this, but we can look at this. Okay, yeah. So this is this is a pretty good example. Like you can see ray tracing on versus ray tracing off. And it's basically just like the complexity of all the reflections and all the light being applied in different ways. Um, and there's a lot of ways of like imitating that with like HDR textures. Um, but doing real time ray tracing is expensive. So it's only been used. I don't I don't know. Um, I think it Yeah. Yeah, there's like specific hardware uh, that this stuff, re that a lot of this stuff requires. Uh, Metro X. Yeah, so it's not, it's not really, I guess there's a, there's a fair amount of game. Oh, Cyberpunk is on here. So I guess if you have the right computer. Oh yeah, so there's a lot of stuff that is. I haven't really been playing as many recent releases. Uh, um. Anyway, uh, that's it for this. Uh, I think that's the last one. There's some links here to some various things uh, where I looked at some of these. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna stop the.